What is the role of religion in our ever-changing world? From the News Channel 5 Network, this is Issues of Faith. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Issues of Faith. Very interesting topic today. We're talking about life outside of our own, life in the universe, extraterrestrial life, and what impact does that have on various religions and potentially even on our religious faith? How, how do they see these? How, how do they see this possibility? And I'm very happy to have with us David Weintraub, Vanderbilt Professor of Astronomy. Um, thank you for being here. Pleasure to be here today. And you've been on Open Line, uh, and we had a, a great discussion. And I'm glad to have you back. You've written two books: Life on Mars, which talks about ethics of of what happens if there is life on Mars, and then Religions and Extraterrestrial Life. We wrote that back in 2014, right? Correct. So. What has brought you to this topic? Why, why are you writing about, about these things, first of all? I've always been fascinated by the connection between science and religion, and the overlap in questions that, in particular, astronomy and astronomers ask that often become religious questions. And astronomers have become very good at discovering planets around other stars. And we're searching for planets around other stars because we are interested in the possibility of life in the universe beyond the Earth. So the possibility now exists in our lifetimes that we might in fact discover life somewhere else in the universe, either with our telescopes studying planets around other stars, or with our robots or our astronauts exploring on Mars or the moon of Jupiter Europa or the moon of Saturn Titan. We may find life in our solar system by exploring or life out there with our telescopes. If we make that discovery, what are we going to do with that knowledge? What, how will that impact us? That's what interests me. And when we say there's some likelihood, I feel like we've all grown up with this likelihood and it hasn't materialized yet, but do we feel more, does it seem more likely now that there is life than at any other point um, or not? You know, wh wh what is the likelihood there's life? I don't think the likelihood has changed. I think our thinking about the likelihood has changed a little bit, in part because when I was 10 years old, the only planets we knew were the planets orbiting the sun. And astronomers speculated about the existence of planets around other stars. We assumed that other stars had their own planets, but we didn't know. We know it now. We've discovered thousands of planets around other stars. We know that planets around other stars are, in fact, common. So we're no longer guessing about that. So one piece of the puzzle is in place. We don't guess, we know. We're now guessing about what comes next. Do any of those planets have life? C could any of those planets host life? We don't know. But I think in our lifetimes, we're going to find out. In our lifetimes? In our lifetimes. And the book that you wrote, Life on Mars, then I'm going to get to religions and extraterrestrial life. You traveled all over the country, really, talking about this on all kinds of TV shows and, and newspapers, everything. Your question was, it, it was an ethical question, right? If you could boil that down, if there's life on Mars, what is our ethical dilemma? I would ask the question, does Mars belong to the Martians? If life does exist on Mars, and again, we don't know, but if life does exist on Mars, even if it's bacteria, do we have the right to colonize Mars and contaminate Mars and put the native life on Mars at risk of extinction simply because we want another planet to live on? That's the ethical question. And when we talk about life on Mars, I feel like we need to quantify here. You're, you're not saying, you know, it's, it's, it's guys running around in, in, in helmets and stuff. It could be bacteria. That's, That's the right. ethical yeah. issue right. here. Th there are no Martians that are bipedal creatures. There are no giraffes, there are no lions, there are no trees, there are no ferns. If there's anything, it's bacteria or something like bacteria living beneath the surface. But that stuff could be there, and that is life. The question is, do we care about that form of life, or do we simply say that we humans have an inalienable right to conquer and take over any world, any planet we like, simply because we can? And as you wrote this book, and then as you traveled around talking about this book, what is your conclusion? Do you think we care? I mean, it's, it's, it's bacteria. Maybe we don't care. 
and I guess what what is what is your conclusion? Most people who heard me talk had never thought about the question. They simply assumed Mars is there, we can go there, so we ought to go there. After they heard me talk, they thought differently. They didn't necessarily agree that we should leave the bacteria alone. Some of them said, it's just bacteria, we don't care. Others of them said, we really ought to think hard about contaminating another world if that world could have life. And do you think this is something NASA is thinking about? The, the ethical question here, or is it all about, let's just get up there? I think NASA is thinking about it, and NASA is actively reinventing the planetary contamination protocols to decide when or if we should, how careful we should be in exploring another world. NASA does have a track record of trying to protect other worlds. One of the moons of Jupiter is called Europa. And Europa, we know, has an ocean beneath the surface. The surface is ice, but deep beneath the surface is a global ocean. It's warm, it's wet, it has all the same materials that the Earth has, so life could exist. And NASA had a spacecraft that was in orbit studying Jupiter for a long time, the Galileo mission, from about 1995 to 2003. And when the Galileo mission was running out of fuel, the decision was made to use the last little bit of fuel to send the spacecraft into Jupiter's atmosphere and have it burn up in Jupiter's atmosphere so that it could not possibly crash into Europa and contaminate Europa. We did the same thing with the spacecraft orbiting Saturn to make sure it didn't crash into a moon called Enceladus, which also has geysers erupting from the surface and it has a subsurface ocean. We have already made the decision not to contaminate certain other worlds. We've also made the decision to contaminate Mars because we're already there. Right. So we have a little bit of schizophrenia about this, but there are very active conversations about when we should or should not contaminate other worlds. And that's a fascinating discussion that I think you're right, people hadn't thought about, it's an a different perspective. Then um, the book you wrote prior to that, Religions and Extraterrestrial Life. Why did you write this book? Because I'm curious and I'm allowed to be curious. And I think everyone should be curious about things that interest them. What interested me was the question, would our religions work in other parts of the universe? Could we convert extraterrestrials to any of our terrestrial religions? Or do some of our religions only work on the Earth? If I, as an astronaut, could travel to another part of the universe, even if other life doesn't exist, could I practice my religion? on a planet 50 million light years from the Earth? Or would it make no sense? How universal are some of our religions? That's what I was interested in. What I tried to do in the book was ask the question, what do the sacred writings of a particular religion have to say about life beyond the Earth? And if the sacred writings had anything to say, what did the the professionals within that religious domain have to say about the own, their own writings. And what did, what did you find, what kind of stands out in, in your findings? I was actually surprised. I thought that most religions would have problems with the discovery of extraterrestrial life because most of what has been written about in the scientific religious literature, in the theological literature, has been about Christianity and for a long time in the history of Christianity, Christianity was very, very earth-centered. There was a strong belief that the earth is the focus of God's attention and you know, if in fact there's a Garden of Eden that was on earth, well life was created here, not elsewhere. And a lot of Christian writers pushed very hard on the idea that life could not exist in other parts of the universe. Life only can exist here. As a scientist, we know that doesn't have to be true. It might be true, but it doesn't have to be true. So when I went into this project on religions and extraterrestrial life, that was the mindset I had, understanding the history of Christianity. Not all modern Christian uh, groups think the same way, but that was the, the history of much of Christianity. So I expected most religions to have problems. You expected most religions to have problems. Yes. And, and again, you're not just talking about Christianity. Here. No. You're Muslim, 
um, Eastern, Western at, religions. Yeah, I looked at Buddhism and Hinduism and Judaism and Mormonism and lots and lots of different religions. What would you say would be the least tolerant to the idea of extraterrestrial life? Not only the least tolerant, but probably the only intolerant religion would be very conservative Christianity. Okay. That most religions either already assume that extraterrestrial life exists or they don't care. So if you're a Buddhist, the idea that you could be reincarnated in another part of the universe is just a natural part of the way you'd think. So therefore, Buddhism would have no trouble with extraterrestrial life. In Judaism, for the most part, what I found is the idea that if God wants to make life somewhere else, that's God's issue. We don't care. Go back to doing what you're doing. It's, it's God's business. It was only within conservative Christianity that there still seemed to be this idea of the, the extreme specialness of humanity. And then there were more complicated issues on whether the salvation of humans would allow other intelligent beings elsewhere in the universe to be saved because Christ didn't necessarily die on the cross for them. And they didn't know until we brought the idea to them about this salvation event that occurred on earth. So there are problems with conservative Christianity. I, I think they're solvable problems if folks within that religious domain want to reinterpret certain ideas, but that's where the problems are. There are questions about the nature of original sin, right? Yes. And, and I think it's a fascinating sort of discussion to think about what propelled exploration uh, here on Earth has often been religion, right? The, yes. the desire to go and and convert people yes. and and save them. And that probably won't be at play, or I wonder to what extent it will be at play, if at all, when we if we go off the earth. It certainly could be at play. And certainly, as you said, it was a major reason why explorers went from Europe to other parts of the earth. They went to convert the heathen, to turn them into followers of their religion. There's no reason to think that same thing won't happen in the future, but the future is a long way off. We have not found anybody out there. We don't have the ability to go very many places right now. It would take tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years with current rocket technology to get to even the nearest star, let alone explore the Mil Milky Way galaxy. So we're not doing this soon. And what humanity will be like in 10,000 or 50,000 or 100,000 years if humanity is still here, there are other issues with that, who knows? So I think we have lots of time to evolve our thinking before we set off this planet. We're gonna, we're gonna take a break, then we'll come back. I wanna ask about that original sin question and then just how um, some of what you've talked about has been received. Um, but thank you for being here. We'll take a break, be back right after this.